Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the E-League podcast. Our E-League broadcast has started up again. So uh, this one's a little bit later uh, than planned. Uh, we didn't get one done last week, did we, Gabe? Nope. There you go. That's Gabe there. Uh, making his usual contribution. <laughs> uh, the weekend weekend was a tough one, Gabe. <clears throat> I was just saying the football gods have forsaken me. Obviously, we've got a fancy football going here. I got absolutely wrecked. Wrecked in my picks. Wrecked against the opponent who picked against me. Brandon Cooks. <laughs> who saw that coming? Minnesota. Incredible defense. Who saw that coming? I think everyone but you. But it's, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the point, right? So, yeah, I got absolutely destroyed. and I, It's cost me 50 bucks, so I'm... I'm Woefully upset about that. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> let's let's talk about Counter-Strike. What's going on? I think we'll start with some uh, roster roundups. And we'll, let's go to Brazil. Why not, right? Brazil uh, currently house, uh, I would say, the best team in the world and certainly Immortals very comfortably within that uh, top 10 after their win at Northern Arena and all the drama forthwith, which I'm not going to talk about on this show. I think that's all been played out at this point, and certainly E-League doesn't like to get involved in drama where possible. Uh, but um, one of the interesting things that they had there was, uh, obviously they were using a stand-in. You'll remember Fur had to go and have surgery. We talked about that on a previous podcast. He had a couple of uh, benign tumors, I believe, uh, which had to be removed uh, from his nose and ear. He's had one of the surgeries, I believe in the nasal area is the first one he's had done, according to pictures on Twitter. And he's coming back because we all know SK Gaming had this ridiculous slump, uh, including that ridiculous, unthinkable 16-0 against Renegades. So what this means now is they've had to rush him back. They're like, look, we know your hearing still might be suboptimal, but we need you back in the team because this isn't working. And you remember when Cold Zero, back when he had a Twitter account, <laughs> yeah. back in back in the depths of time, uh, he, of course, was very vocal about Showtime and, and how bad he was. He said, it's incredibly hard to play with a player that doesn't understand the basics of Counter-Strike, which I think is incredibly harsh on Showtime. But that said, he certainly not a caliber of player who belongs to be talked about in the same breath as SK Gaming. And I was very dubious when they picked him up. I didn't think it was going to be a good fit, and it looks that way. You know, look, wonderful experience for Showtime. He'll always be able to talk about his brief, brief time in SK Gaming. Um, but it's kind of like, have you ever seen that photo of that dude who um, he stood in for, like, the drummer from the Beatles? He stood in for, like, you know... Ringo Starr or something? No. <laughs> and like, okay, there's this famous photo. Um, I'm sure someone will know what I'm talking about. But uh, there's this famous photo on the internet of a dude, and it's like he stood in for one leg of a Beatles tour, I think it was. And he, he was just literally a session drummer that they used. Ringo Starr wanted a holiday or, you know, broken a finger or something innocuous. And the photo was of him in an airport going back alone to his regular life. You know, he's had the screaming groupies, he's had the parties, he's had the rock and roll. He's played on stage to, you know, huge crowds. And now he's got to go back to work in the post office or whatever, yeah. you know. <laughs> and he's just sat in the airport with this look on his face like, that was it. That was the high water mark. That's as good as life gets. And I just wonder if when Showtime was flying back uh, home, you know, or traveling back home, he had a similar look on his face after his time in SK Gaming. But anyway, it's not all bad news because... Um, while Showtime was the make way in Immortals when they brought Zeus in, Luminosity have changed it up. We had a, 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 this is kind of the third Brazilian team. And I thought this was a surprise, you know. They've been picked up by Luminosity. Uh, Steve Mida, the uh, manager over there, is continuing his kind of commitment to the Brazilian scene. They picked up, uh, you know, this, this third Brazilian team that was uh, available. And they had a roster change. So they took out a player called Knack and a player called Bit, who were accomplished players. They're, they're experienced. They're relatively well-known. Certainly if you follow Brazilian Counter-Strike and, and you, you know you go back a ways, you would know who these guys are. Well, they've both been uh, released from Luminosity. Um, and not entirely clear why. I think it could just be a form issue. You know, they did lose to Echo Fox. Uh, in um, that wild card match with uh, in in the ESL Pro League, 
<clears throat> and then obviously in uh, the uh, uh, the online component, the Star Series Season Two qualifier, they were fifth to eighth there, um, and I think they didn't do much at the Cyber Power PC Summer Pro Series that Cloud9 won either. So they kind of were struggling a little bit to get up into the deep runs in, in the tournament. And I guess now, I think there's a reasonable expectation if you're a Brazilian team that you should be beating North American teams right now, you know. So uh, they, they obviously decided they had to make a change. So Showtime goes there. Showtime's in. Uh, it's back. It's Showtime, you might say. Uh, and he gets to... Uh, go in there with a player called SHZ, uh, who also had been standing in uh, for for that team before and had helped them out. So what this does for Luminosity, I, I don't really know. I, I, I look at the roster, and there's less impressive names there, in my opinion, in terms of how storied they are and, and their pedigree. But ultimately, that doesn't mean a lot. We're entering into a newer phase of Counter-Strike. We're starting to see new players come through. Players that don't have that pedigree, players that don't have those big names they're coming in now and, and and saying look we can play better than these guys it doesn't matter if they've got 10 years counter-strike experience you know they're they're done they're played out we've only been playing for two years and we're at a similar if not higher level so our ceilings most likely to be higher um so I'm, i'll watch with great interest if luminosity can actually do anything it'd be unthinkable if brazil could get another team into that top 10 i, I certainly don't think they'll achieve that but um you know, they're, they're, a, they're a stealth. They're a dark horse, so to yeah, speak. I'm, I'm rooting for them. I'd like to see this. Yeah. I, 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 no, you're I, not, no, no, you're no, not Gabe. You're I'm just saying. lying. <laughs> you're lying. Stop pandering. Stop pandering, Gabe. Um, so that's interesting. So that was a roster swap. Now, also interesting, you will remember MK, the Bulgarians. Remember them? Yes. Yeah, they just won that ESEA global oh, yeah, we tournament. Yeah, yeah, we did. Previous mm -hmm. podcast, right? See, it's, there is a method to my madness game yeah, when I'm know. picking topics. Like, I like to keep, <laughs> I like to keep readers informed. I like storylines to continue and develop. And, Amazing. you know, people think I just, you know, roll out of bed with a hangover and talk into a microphone. Absolutely not true. Definitely not true. Definitely not true today. Um, so, MK has kind of been in free fall since winning that tournament. And it's left me kind of scratching my head as to what's going on. Because, okay, we've got all of that drama around Dreamer and his potential VAC ban, and, and he, he maintains his innocence. Valve have actually took a long, hard look at it and investigated it and said, well, whatever he maintains, that's not necessarily the case according to our findings. Uh, and we're in this holding pattern, basically, where you know you're not going to, quite simply put valve aren't gonna budge and and it seems like dreamer isn't either so i guess we'll never know the entire truth about that incident but i'm inclined to believe valve <laughs> all things told you know that they they would be legally liable for example if yeah. they were to you know ban somebody on false pretenses so mk win this tournament you're like well great news now what now what happens they're showing they can compete with that tier two internationally so where do they go from here? Are they going to cut Dreamer and accept it that it's never the, the unbanning is never going to happen? Are they going to labor on and try and play in these smaller tournaments? Well, none of those things happened, Gabe. What happened? Here's what happened. Uh, first of all, their, their in-game leader, I believe, Spy Leader, which is a great name if you are a leader. Um, I don't know where the spy part comes from, but you know, <laughs> whatever. He, he goes. He leaves the team. He's just out. So, and and it was very sudden. Um, so, you know, they win that global challenge for ESCA, and he leaves, and he put a statement out, and he said, um, after the ESCA global championship finals in Poland, our relationship was not good at all. We did not communicate right. We did not practice, uh, and, and practice not worked like before. Maybe this paved the way for where the team was right now. On top of this, yesterday we lost a local event here in Bulgaria, which resulted in many insults towards me coming from Dreamer. Wow. Mm. I have always supported and helped Dreamer in the past, but with his attitude and actions, he showed that he does not deserve it. This was the tipping point. I decided to leave the team and play somewhere else. I am willing to play with everyone from the lineup in the future, except Dreamer. I will rest for five to ten days to clear my thoughts and decide what to do next. This time, 
I want to play for a team that can attend all tournaments, including majors. Best of luck to uh, NKL, Victor, and Bubble, even though we may not play in the same team. Thanks to all of my fans and supporters, you will see me playing again soon. Do you think there was something under underlying going on there? Possibly. Too? I mean, at the same time that this has happened, uh, Spiley defines himself being scrutinized for some also very dubious clips mm. online. Um, and you know we, we we see this recurring trend now that that I think I think it's fair to say the community has lost a little bit of confidence in anti cheat measures as a whole across Counter Strike holistically. You know, no one's necessarily to blame. I I, I think people just don't necessarily trust the system. Uh, people are seeing things in game with their eye that they can't explain, and this is leading to. You know, I don't want to say witch hunt, I don't want to say hysteria, but it's leading to the idea that there are potentially more cheaters than I think there actually are. And you couple that with the average experience that people have in matchmaking, and you know, I, I talk a lot about this, that people's perception becomes very narrow based on their own experiences. So if I play a game and one guy lands a chance headshot through a smoke, I just think that's luck, right? I don't think that's a big deal. But there's a lot of people who, if it happens two or three games in a row, they become convinced everyone's cheating. Everyone's cheating. It can't just be the law of averages. You know, and you see clips get uploaded to Reddit where people are calling other people cheaters. And it's so obvious that they're not cheating. You know, you can see it all played out from their point of view. It's just that good. Yeah, you're, well, it's not even that. Like, your toes might be sticking out oh, through a smoke. Gotcha, yeah. And you've got the ostrich effect going on, which is, oh, if I can't see you, you can't see me. Of course, that's not true. Certainly not true with the way FPS mechanics work. So a lot of people are convinced there's more cheaters than there actually are. That's just my opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think in the absence of robust measures and high-profile uh, busts, you know, people getting actually caught, we haven't had a high-profile you know, bust for a while since what was dubbed the vacuuming. <laughs> um, we haven't had that. And I think because of that, people assume that, well, no busts mean the system's broken. People are more inclined to believe that than no busts means maybe no one's cheating. Now, I think that'd be an absurd stance because sports history teaches us someone will always break the rules. But um, but certainly these clips have emerged of Spy Leader and, and they're odd. You know, they are odd. I think uh, there's one where um, someone is running up Boiler on Inferno and obviously there's a wall here and he's in pit and there's a staircase so as you run up the staircase you can the x-ray shows you through the wall as you're running up so if you're in pit you can see that if you had x-ray right now players shouldn't have x-ray what happens is coincidentally at the time this chap runs up the stairs wee willy winky style uh spy leader's gun shoots at him as if he was there there's two explanations. Uh, you know, one is that he is pre-firing based on a feeling or a sound. Uh, and the other, of course, is that he can see that person through the wall and he's misjudged it. And there was another clip, another follow-up clip, where he jumps with a scout on overpass. And again, somebody's crouching on that stairwell on overpass and from a site you can see through that wall. And he shoots exactly where that person is, but of course there's a wall in the way. And uh, some joker made a Reddit thread the other day saying, oh look, Sp you know, Spy Leader saw a, uh, a bug in the grass and shot at it. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, they're implying that he cheated. Now again, these things can be highly coincidental, but I think again, in this, in this kind of uh, current climate, people are getting worried and I, I wonder if it's something to do with this, because I'm not a big believer in coincidences. <clears throat> I certainly don't think it's a coincidence that the two people arguing is someone who is banned for cheating, maintaining his innocence, and the leader of the team who suddenly has strange clips coming out. Well, where are these clips coming from? Because, you know, the people are just finding the, them. But you were talking about the frames per second issue. Mm. Uh, mm. Like it could mm. be that could be an issue as well Is maybe we're missing a couple of frames. Where we actually do see the toe or the foot or you couldn't. You couldn't? And you couldn't on these clips in particular. Mm -hmm. you, the only explanation would have to be coincidence. Gotcha. That's the only viable explanation. That's fine, right? 
Um, because coincidences can happen. And very often we attach meaning to coincidences that isn't there because that's the nature of the human brain. But certainly all of this coming together at once. You know me, I, I, again, I'm, I'm doing that thing. I don't believe in... You're a skeptic. Yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't believe in... Because I've seen so much yeah, yeah. in my time in eSports. And I think where there's a lot of, of, of smoke in eSports, very often there is a fire. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. So I'm not obviously accusing Spy Leader or, or, or at all. I mean, I, I'm always inclined to give people the benefit of the doubt unless there's irrefutable evidence. I think that's the, that's the standard we have to hold ourselves up to. And certainly I've said that. I've said that you can't just do it, you know, on, on popularity. You know, we've seen, for example, CLG's new pickup, Sabrosa. He's come under a lot of scrutiny for his aiming style, which is very snappy and looks unnatural. And people have said, well, you know, I, I feel that this player has come from nowhere. He has no reputation, no pedigree. Therefore, he's got to be cheating. But somebody with a similar style, people would be inclined, if they did have that reputation and pedigree, they'd be inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I don't think that's fair. You've got to judge the evidence on its merits. And reputation um, really shouldn't come into it. So... You've got these spy lead clips going on. You've got Dreamer and Spy Leader having a big argument. Who knows what that was about? And then the follow-up to this is that uh, Bubble, he then exits too. Uh, so he leaves a few days uh, after this. And then in a, in a statement, uh, he says, Today is the day I leave my friends and teammates. I experienced a lot with them and will never forget these things. I will keep all the beautiful memories we had wherever I go. I don't know how beautiful these memories were ultimately, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, if... if um, Spy didn't make it seem very... Well, you know, <laughs> if, 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 if yeah. struggling to break out for, uh, from the Bulgarian yeah. scene, um, you know, struggling to get sponsorships and, and competing in Tier 2 tournaments is beautiful, then, uh, you know, I, I, I guess we have very different definitions. Uh, but he says, I'm leaving because of the issues we had on our team. We tried a lot of times to fix them, but without success. And in the last two weeks, I lost faith that we could solve these problems. The decision to leave the team was a hard one to make. I will not stop playing, and I'm already looking for a new team in the international scene. So let's forget just about all the clips and the drama with Spy Leader for just a second. Let's just instead talk about what's happening here. And what I think is going on is... In the absence of kicking Dreamer, I, I, I think this is going to be like everyone's just going to leave. It's like, hey, Dreamer. Their, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Dreamer, you keep you keep the team. It's all <laughs> yours, buddy. You keep MK. And I think these are the four might, might leave and make their own team. Yeah. Because ultimately, there is no getting away from it. Dreamer is the best player. He's the best player in Bulgaria. He's the best player on that team. But he's banned. He's banned from majors and therefore from minors all Valve tournaments, and I think eventually in the future, I think we get to a place where people might be able to circumnavigate some of the legal issues, because uh, that's another thing people don't realize. A lot of people talk about how, oh, why don't we just have a blacklist of banned players that we use in all leagues? Well, you can't do that. There's certain countries that have certain laws, and certainly ESL, who are based in Germany, where they actually have laws for these types of things, um, they, they wouldn't be able to do it. They wouldn't be able to operate a blacklist uh, they need Valve to kind of say, you have to follow our rules. And of course, Valve don't do that for other Valve tournaments. So they would be liable, ESL. So they don't do a blacklist. You can't do it. And certainly, it's never been implemented. And I, I think people forget that there is almost like a legal I issue there. So uh, I, I, I think all of the team are kind of coming to the realization that ultimately, as good as Dreamer is, he's holding them back. They're never going to be in a position where they can actually compete in the tournaments they want to compete in. Clearly, there's some friction there between the in-game leader and, obviously, the star player, which is never good. Uh, so, yeah. So, I think they're going to leave one by one, and Dream is going to be left as the sole member <laughs> of MK with no one to recruit. And it's going to be incredibly hard for him to do that. I mean, I, I mean at this point, you know... I, I kind of feel once you get hit with that permanent ban from the big tournaments, I kind of feel that retirement has to be a logical step. It's either that or you channel all your energy into fighting it. But ultimately, in Dreamer's case, <clears throat> why this isn't like a match-fixing thing, 
he he has been investigated valve have done their due diligence and inarguably they agree that his version of events does not tally with their findings he's done that's that mm-hmm. no majors or minors for you and as a result I, I i think you know he needs to give some long hard thoughts to retirement it's a tragedy it would make a great you know 30 for 30 type style documentary or disney movie yeah, but like one of, one of them dark Disney movies, <laughs> like a Disney dark. movie in reverse, where it's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, where it's like it just ends with Bambi's mother's mother getting shot, right? For no reason. There's no redemption or journey. Just there you go. Bang. She's dead. Mm. So I think I think he should definitely give some um, serious thoughts to to uh, retirement at this point, because where do you go? And you're holding everyone back and no one's going to play with you. You know, it, it's it's not good, is it? It's not. It's not like you've got a thriving scene anyway. You can't just like, oh well, I'll go to the second best Belgian team. Yeah, they're playing local land tournaments, mate. They probably got about thirty hours between them. Enjoy, mm-hmm. you know. So, oh how I miss headshot bombers. <laughs> they were uh, they were a good team. Anyway, so we'll no doubt monitor the the remaining drama <clears throat> while we're talking about bands. Uh, you, you, you probably this this will be before your time, Gabe. As mm-hmm. so many things often are. Yes, eighteen hundreds. Yes, <laughs> Effectio, uh, French player who was suspended indefinitely from all Valve sponsored events um, for uh, match fixing while he was in Epsilon. This is back in two thousand and fourteen. Now, I've made my views on the match fixing issue quite, uh, you know, clear. And that is that I absolutely will not tolerate uh, match fixing. I think it's deplorable. This is why I've dedicated so much of my time to investigating match fixing. And, you know, people forget it wasn't just I buy power that I got. I did find a few of the real smaller fish, if you like. And I, I've certainly outed them. And, and hopefully that continues. <clears throat> and I'd definitely like to see more robust measures put in place. Uh, to to enable us to investigate them. I'd like it to be that if you're using any form of API uh, for betting, and of course we're well past that point, but I would have liked to have seen it, that you'd be compelled to cooperate with investigations from the IP holder. Uh, so Valve could demand that information. Unfortunately, I think the, the climate we're in now with kind of the demise of, of skins gambling, I feel we're going to lose a lot of the information, a lot of the databases, a lot of the betting patterns that would make it absolutely inarguable whether or not people had fixed matches and people are going to get away with it now can i dumb it down real quick yeah, yeah, yeah go talk on. about how would people fix a match <clears throat> you hundreds of ways but okay so basically how it works in counter-strike is you uh okay so you play an opponent in a game you obviously want to ideally you want to pick games that are inconsequential no one wants to throw a final with this prize money on on the line because the money you would get for the throw probably wouldn't you know, outweigh the prize money unless it was a small online tournament. You then communicate with uh, a betting uh, outlet or a gambler or a fixer. Uh, and what you have to do is you have to find a game where it's vaguely believable you could lose and the odds are hugely skewed because how it works is... Uh, or certainly how it used to work, was if a team was a favorite, they would have favorable odds. And then as people bet more on the favorite, those odds would become more and more, so you would get less of a return. And you would very often see these games where teams would have 80 90% favorable odds, meaning the returns would be minuscule going up against these underdog teams, where if you would bet on them, you'd get huge returns. Mm-hmm. If you put max value bets on, you would get huge returns. And what you do is you go to one of the fixers and you go, we're not going to we're not going to try this game. We're going to lose it. And in exchange for a cut of the profits you get from betting over here, uh, we'll, we'll we'll lose the game. Okay, so it's very like boxing. Sort yeah, of we we take a dive. The other team, the winning team, doesn't even know, right? They don't know the fix is in. It's the losing team that that has to know because that they control it. Right. So then what would happen is um, you then have lots of dummy accounts, multiple hundreds in some cases, uh, and then you would place bets. All max bets on those accounts, knowing the result was assured mm-hmm. one way or the other. So that's how it would work in Counter-Strike. Now, as I said, 
I definitely don't think people should be getting away with that. Once you start attacking the credibility of any sport, it, it, it's done. You know, once you can't believe the results are real, it's done. Once there's rampant fixing, it, it's over. It's over. People won't want to watch it. Unless it's uh, wrestling. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, right? And that's, that's the thing. I, I think some people would actually want it to kind of get to that stage, like, right. you know, because that would be... I do, that would be a better's dream if everybody knew the outcomes. Mm. So Effexio, it was for something ridiculous, 100 euros. And uh, he's come out of kind of the woodwork now, and he's talking about trying to get back into the game and what does he need to do to do it. So the Esports Observer, they ran this long report and long interview about Effexio. That's Joey Effexio Schlosser, if anyone wants to look him up. Uh, and, you know, it, it's super interesting because I definitely cannot get on board with the idea of a lifetime ban. I, I can't. I can't because, you know, people forget that these are, like, young guys. Like, I know, you, right, everyone says the same thing. Well, I knew right from wrong when I was that. Okay, let's just hold on a second, right? For starters, right from wrong. It applies in multiple situations, right? So it's like you might know the right and wrong in this situation, but you might not know the right and wrong in this situation. Or, you know, you know it's wrong, but equally people like to take risks. Human beings like to push the boundaries on, 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 on what the rules are. Bend them. Can I get away with this? Can I, you know, we're like that as creatures, right? So it doesn't justify it, but certainly this was like for 100 euros. This was a meaningless game that they threw to just get some skins on their account, right? So it's stupid, but I don't think people had the awareness of what it means in a bigger picture. The average esports competitor can't see the bigger picture. It's, you know, it, it, they don't understand how it tears away the fabric of the, of the game in a way that a seasoned sports reporter might. Um, and certainly, <clears throat> I think a lot of these people weren't around to watch what happened in Brood War, for example, Starcraft, how that was ruined by an institutional match fixing uh, in Kesper leagues, and and you know people people uh, went to jail o over that. So and, and that was a systemic match fixing environment. This was a one off game for a chump change. Yeah. Now definitely doesn't excuse it. You've got to be banned for that. You have to serve a penalty. But this is where it gets interesting. Should that penalty be life? And I, I generally believe in, for first offenses, clemency, second chances, rehabilitation. These are the foundations and the principles of a civilized society, in my opinion. So if, uh, Effexio has come out and, and talked a lot about what he uh, wants to do, and he's been working with something called the Esports Integrity Coalition, which is run by a lawyer. Uh, that I know um, since he's coming to esports, uh, called Ian Smith, great guy. I've interviewed him in the past, uh, and he has worked with like the International Cricket Board on match fixing. He's represented people, and while he has been on both sides of the equation when it comes to match fixing, he, like me, believes that you know you've got to look at each case and look at its merits. Is somebody who is experienced, older, a veteran in the sport? Uh, who is literally fixing multiple games for profit, do they deserve the same punishment as an illiterate 18-year-old who is bullied by his peers into being involved in match fixing? And that's what's happened in Pakistani cricket, for example, I believe. So he... He, he is of the idea that you have to judge each case on its merits and that certainly there has to be a route back, that a lifetime ban is unthinkable. Now, you Americans, uh, you talk a lot about Pete Rose. Uh, and, you know, I don't know a lot about baseball because, frankly, and may the turn of gods forgive me, I find it incredibly boring. Um, but definitely keep watching it, though, on, on, on Turner it's Sports. Yeah, it's, it. It, our coverage is great. But, you know, I find the sport boring. But our coverage isn't. There you go. I, I, think I've, I think I've saved it, right? Yeah. But um, Pete Rose is the name that gets brought up all the time. And he's got this permanent ban. He'll never be inducted from the Hall of Fame. What people never talk about when they bring up the Pete Rose thing is that he actually agreed to that. Like when, you know, it was like, if we don't pursue other charges, if you, you know, if you don't fight this, you go on this list of people who were permanently 
uh, deemed not allowed to be involved in the sport of baseball. And Pete Rose agreed to that. And he was like, yeah, okay, I guess it's worth it not to have my name dragged through the mud. Investigations that subsequently happened showed that he bet between 84 and 86. And all he was doing was gambling on matches. It wasn't that. It wasn't even necessarily any allegation of him fixing any outcomes. He was just violating a code of conduct. And because subsequently it was then ruled, if you were on that list, you can never be in the Hall of Fame, Pete Rose, with these amazing career stats, is out and, and, and isn't allowed to be involved in baseball. You know, he's persona non grata. Now, I think that's unreasonable. I think a lot of people in sports feel that is unreasonable. And therefore, I think if we can extrapolate that somebody who broke a code of conduct for two years in a very naive fashion, if people can argue that he deserves a second chance, and he's 75, Pete Rose, you know, he's getting on. He's old. Mm -hmm. uh, he's potentially running out of chances for this redemptive element to the end of his story, and I, I hope people see sense about that. Um, you know, w w one match for, for pocket change, life ban, it seems harsh on paper. So, <clears throat> interestingly enough, Afexio talked about how he wants to be involved in good causes, wants to get back to redemption. So he's saying if he is allowed a second chance, uh, he would do talks on match fixing. He would go out and talk to other players, younger players, talk about how match fixing can happen, what things lead to it, and encourage people how to stay away from it, who not to associate with, how to resist the pressures. Basically be that kind of look what happened to me story. And then on top of that, he also would say that if he was allowed to compete, the first $10,000 that he made in prize money, he'd donate. That's nice. Like to that. good causes. Uh, and he would also basically participate as an ongoing consultant in anti-corruption training uh, with, sport, with Sports Radar and ESIC. He's also issued a letter um, saying that uh, he's incredibly sorry about what he did. Um, so, you know, again, I don't want to I don't want to use my position to talk about, you know, what we what Valve should and shouldn't do. Um, I don't want to use my position to say this is the absolute way that it should be done. But I, I definitely think it's worth looking at again. And this is an evolving space. Do we do we want to have our own rules and do we want match fixing to be for you know be for life i keep in mind there was an example of a chap one of the first high profile match fixing cases in dota 2 chap only got banned for a year um i think a year is pretty good I, you know i i i might be inclined to lean towards two i think the problem is like ultimately in real terms a year isn't all that long and again it's got to be flexible you can't it can't be an immutable sentence there's got to be context right does somebody who fixes hundreds of games get the same ban as somebody who fixes one? I think if we have that system, again, we can point to flaws in it. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think we need to make a decision about what we want. Do we want it to be the standard in esports? If you fix a match, you're banned for life. Or do we want it to be that actually the people that have a vested interest in this, they're going to take a look at it and, and make some decisions about it? Do we need a, an... an independent arbitrary body you know we get back to that old adage you know yeah, do they have like a board of um, board of members that kind of take a look at you and deal with you individually or is it just like that yeah of like the, the well, hell people and, and th th this is the problem that's what i was gonna say it gets back to that old adage of who watches the watchman right like what we what we what we don't have in esports is anybody that kind of presides over the decision makers to make sure these decisions are fair we've never had that there's very little recourse you can't really do anything if you're an esports professional and somebody deems you to be, uh, you know, you can't play our game anymore. There's very little you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And and you might argue that's fair. Certainly it's deserved in some cases. Uh, and certainly sometimes, you know, I've seen some extreme cases of bad behavior where I think it's actually better for the individual that they're banned from the game <laughs> because it, it's affecting their mental health. It's yeah. affecting their behavior. So... But where, it's where do you go? Where do you go? You know, when Riot say, right, you can't play an LCS. Where do you go if, uh, you know, uh, other developers don't want to, you know, recognize your existence and allow you to play in tournaments? Where, where do you go from there? And there isn't anywhere. You've just kind of suck it up. And like we talked about Dreamer having why retirement because he's effectively done. You know, he's not. On paper, he isn't. 
but the what the realities of the infrastructure of esports means that he is you know and it's the same here um so i i, I like to see just just a revision and i understand that the viewpoint is you've got to be terrified of two things like getting caught of doing two things you've got to be terrified of cheating getting caught cheating you've got to be terrified of getting caught fixing a match you've absolutely got to be mortally afraid of those two things because if there's no fear factor then everyone would do it right so well not everyone <laughs> some people aren't dishonest pieces of shit so uh anyway let's move on let's talk about some actual games let's talk about godsend I'm starting to get to that stage where people are messaging me saying that I might need to eat some humble pie. <laughs> and despite my ample frame, there is one type of pie I will not eat, <laughs> and that is humble pie. I will not do it. Uh, basically, you know, I, I stand by my original assessment. I did a YouTube video on the day that this huge Swedish shuffle was announced, and I felt that Godsent had done the requisite... You know, they've done enough to be deemed the best team in, in Sweden. You know, I, I really felt that. And, uh, you know, okay. So they definitely have done enough, but they haven't, the results haven't matched the potential. You know, they haven't really lived up to it. And I don't know why that is. I can't quite put my finger on it. You know, I, I want to be able to define it. I want to be able to explain it, but I can't, and I don't know why. Uh, they've got, the, for me, they they took the best players out of that Fnatic team on form uh, or, 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 or on potential, and they started playing better individually. You know, I'm, I'm looking at JW. I think he's a better player in Godsent than he was towards the end of his Fnatic tenure. I'm watching Flusher. I think Flusher's doing Flusher things, like Flusher always does. You know, I, I, I think uh, Crims has, has stepped up a little bit as well because he was in a pretty bad place towards the end of Fnatic. And I don't think tactically they're all that bad. I'm at a loss to explain why they're underperforming. But it's, it's very apparent that this is a real thing. In fact, there's a, as very often fans will do, they've gone from being called Godsent to being called Homesent. Because that's where they end up every time they go for a qualifier, every time they go to a LAN tournament. And they've had this terrible run where, you know, we, we, we saw them uh, not get to ESL New York. Uh, we saw them uh, go, go bomb out in, in Starladder. And, of course, and this is the most uh, important part to talk about, or rather preliminaries, I should say. Um, so they, they play alternate attacks. This should be an easy game for them. This should be a slam dunk. This should be <clears throat> uh, just a, a walk-in to, to get to the later stages in Atlanta. And, and to lose to this team that has done absolutely nothing, that has no high-profile result, is incredibly bad, you know, bad. It's bad news. And if people are going to point to it being an online qualifier, which you know I'm, I'm inclined to do a little bit, I'm inclined to say, you know, oh, it's online, so Germans, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we can all, we can all talk about that, but the reality is Godsent have had multiple problems online, at LAN. Mm -hmm. You know, NIP crushed them, 16-5 in Kiev. And think about what we said on the podcast when we were talking about this huge Swedish resurgence. And I was like, well, NIP, they are now the worst team in Sweden. It's official. It... <laughs> clearly isn't right because they've just want to make yeah no 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 here's the thing though that that'll happen dude that'll happen you know you you've got to get it wrong now and then to make all the times you're right actually mean something and people for, people forget that uh you know if you're right every, every time you make a prediction if you're right every time you make an assessment it just becomes background noise so it's nice to be wrong but there's there's no doubt right now that Fnatic and godsend are, are lagging behind this new look nip so i'll just wrap up my points on godsend I'm definitely not going to eat humble pie. Uh, <laughs> no chance, because I, I still think they've got that incredible potential. I think they can be as good as the previous iteration of Fnatic. I think they've got all the components there. They might be one roster swap away from from fine-tuning 
uh, that, but certainly they've got the core of the Fnatic team that dominated 2015, like few teams dominate any sport. There is no doubt in my mind they can get back to that level. I don't know why it's not happening now. Perhaps it's too much too soon. But literally, after being announced, they were thrown straight in the games. I mean, they played a game that day. You know, the, 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 hey, everyone, we've got this new team. Right now, we're in, we must win qualifier. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. You know, that, that's a lot. I don't know if they've had a lot of time to kind of decompress because yeah. they were right into the busy end of the season. This is a thick wedge of the season now. Loads of vitally important games, loads of qualifiers, preliminary rounds, all sorts of stuff going on. Land tournaments, international events, they're, they're going to be stretched. And how much work are they able to do? I don't even know what their arrangements are. You know, look, are, are they in team houses? Are they boot camping? Nobody knows yet, right? Nobody knows what the long-term godsend looks like. So I'm inclined to hold on and, and say that I think they're going to get there and live up to what I said uh, and, and bookmark this podcast mm -hmm. uh, for when they do so I can be right again. Now, from being wrong to being absolutely resoundingly okay. right, no doubt about it. What did we say, Gabe, about Makalela joining Nip? They were going to destroy. Yeah, well, <laughs> hyperbole, Gabe, hyperbole. But... Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, I, I said that it was going to be an upgrade for Pitt. Something happens when Makalela's in Nip. Something happens. I can't explain it. Uh, if I could, I'd probably not be doing a, a podcast where I ramble incoherently. I'd probably be making some, you know, incredible money being like some sort of talent scout, right? Or something like that. The, 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 but the reality is when Makalela plays with those players, they it just clicks it just works and i can't explain why but let's look at the evidence they played five tournaments with him now they made it to four finals and they won two of them is he staying do we, do we think he's okay gonna stay? well let's just talk about what happened in the star ladder first right so they're out in kiev their run is pretty good in my opinion they beat hell i mean fair enough like i i, I think i could probably get some people out the office and give them a game right now um, they, they got all sorts of problems. But then they, they who else did they beat? Uh, so they beat Hellraiser, they beat Godsent, obviously, which we just talked about. They beat Astralis, pretty good. Uh, they beat Cloud9, the resurgent Cloud9, and then they beat G2. So as tournament runs go, that's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And the final with G2 is one of the best finals I've seen in, in recent memory. Certainly, probably, um, you know, the, the Virtus Pro uh, Fnatic game always good but Virtus Pro were pretty dominant in that in our e-league final this was a lot more tense especially that second map on overpass you know overtimes in there people missing shots nerves getting people wonderfully entertaining but for NIP to win that tournament is ridiculous you look at that field and you just you, you think right okay well you know VP are back G2 are there Na'Vi home soil it is you know Astralis have got to win something soon mm-hmm there's no, you know, could, could God send them? Say? Everyone's talking about all these teams, not NIP. And NIP using a stand-in. So, as my colleague Duncan uh, Shields uh, said, they're the first team to win a major tournament, not a major, but, but a major-sized tournament, with a stand-in. Never, it's never been done before. Uh, so that's incredible. He, I mean, he, he wasn't really like, he is a stand-in. But he's been with them for so long. Well, yeah, but no, no, but but he was he was with them for so long, and then of course he went to phase, and he had a period where he didn't play for them. Quite, and he's been a free agent for all this time. He's been a free agent for months, so nobody was expecting this to work, and people were very confused as to why it was Makalela. You know, they used Disco Doplin, who is uh, you know, we've <laughs> talked about him. Love that you know, guy. Yeah, yeah, you love that guy. <laughs> uh, Disco Doplin. They used him online. And they, they've got pretty good, it's decent form online coming into this in the ESL Pro League. I think they've dropped three maps. But then again, the teams have been playing, you know, it's teams they realistically should be beating. Uh, and they did drop maps to the ones that are vaguely competitive. You know, like, I think they dropped a map to Envious, you know, teams like this. So, you put Makalela in, you're not really expecting it to just suddenly ramp up. But his statistics over the course of the tournament were unbelievable. Uh, he certainly still had that propensity for um, missing some of the easier shots and then hitting the hard ones. But again, this is what I mean. You don't quantify Makalela by statistics. 
he he he's he's not a for me he's definitely nowhere near a top five orpa he's not but he's good when it counts and his rifling is yeah you know he's outside of what happened in inclusion of poker where he had probably the when when uh g2 made it to the semi-finals i think he had the most clutches of any player at that tournament uh outside of that his clutch play isn't particularly renowned uh his pistol plays you know average but there's just something about him when he gets with these this particular group of players and he he's a he's a like he's obviously done some growing up i think as well there's a lot of talk about, you know, would NIP want to play with him because he was a rager, he banged his table uh, a lot, he he gets very agitated if things don't go his way. That used to be the case, you know, I saw that firsthand when they won a tournament uh, in Finland called Assembly, uh, and I, I watched him, and I could see that Forrest and Get Right, they don't like that, they don't want to be around that, that's not their style, they're the, they're the archetypal Swedes in, in that sense, very cool don't really give a lot away, not very high-level emotion. You know, existers like that as well. They're, they're, they're just not that kind of team, right? So I understood it, you know, like it wasn't a good fit. But sometimes you've got to let those creative energies, those creative differences, different personalities kind of come together and just try and work through it. Because yeah. sometimes you might, you know, uh, hate hate each other, uh, you know, but, but if it works and you're winning games, who cares? Who cares? So I'm kind of hoping now that they've won this tournament, it really underlines that with Makalela they're a better team. And they always were. I never bought that nonsense about let's get Arlu in the team that people were saying, like, oh, Arlu will be the perfect fit for NIP. I never thought he was a perfect fit. I think they stabilized. I thought they were functional with him in the team. They had some decent moments. They had some good runs. They had some impressive victories, but they never looked like the finished article to me with Arlo in the team. It always kind of felt like he he's here in the absence of anyone else we can realistically work with. And I'm sure a lot of people will say that's crazy talk and say I'm insane or whatever, but that's how it always felt to me. And meanwhile, back when they had Makalela, even with those personal differences, it felt like a more complete team. It felt like a, a better fit. Mm -hmm. And here they are winning a huge tournament. This is This is big. This was a tough field. You know, this was un unreal that they won this. Um, and Makalela will get a lot of the pl plaudits uh, because that's the story. But, you know, everyone stepped up. Everyone did their job. My contention is that I think having Makalela in the team, I think he gives you that. I think he makes you a more energetic team. I think he makes you more vital. Yeah. He pumps people up, you know. And it was good to see that there was nothing awkward or forced about, like, high fives and fist bumps between them. You know, they, they, they weren't giving each other death stares. And and, and Makalela had to toned it down a lot. Now, given that I don't even necessarily believe that Pitt is actually injured, and sorry if you're watching this, Pitt, and you are, and you're all laid up, but I, I'm dubious about it. Um, I, 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 think this is, I think this is the move. I think you keep him now. I think this is proof of concept that it can work. Yeah. And and if if they don't, I think it's insanity. I think if I think if Makalela leaves NIP, goes back to free agency, I, I'd you know I I wouldn't know, but you know, black is white and up is down, right? Like that, that would make no sense to me whatsoever. And if he did, someone would probably pick him up. Well, you'd hope so. Yeah. But I mean, this is a player who is just so talent. You know, he he is talented, but I can't quite quantify where that talent lies. He's just good. It, it, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's like you what you might watch him play. I never, you know, people used to call him Whiffalela because he would miss like shots. It's a terrible nickname, by the way. Whoever come up with that one is is, <laughs> is, is a buffoon. But um, people used to call him that, and it was just like, dude, like you know, even the best missed shots. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen it happen to Kenny S? Gosh, you have. You know, and Kenny S is a much better player than Michaelayla, but it can happen to anyone. So. Just a just just a great story that NIP kind of powered through and, and were able to to win uh, in in the fashion that they did and like real talk if if Makalela ends up uh, leaving again I I just think it's a missed opportunity for NIP to to put themselves back on the international stage and they need all the help they can get right now we know that Threat wasn't there for example Threat wasn't out in Kiev their coach he was at home. 
So at least that's my understanding. I Testing. Cer- yeah, I certainly didn't see him. And obviously with this Valve ruling, yeah. we know through Now, the system that they had before all revolved around him. He, he was doing the tactics. He was doing the calling. Now that Valve have introduced this ruling, NIP go on that slump. You know, we, we, we saw them have some quite terrible games. We saw them at the previous major, you know, they lost the flip side. They got manhandled by Virtus Pro out here in E-League. Um, they didn't look great. Mm-hmm. And they've obviously had a lot to deal with and a lot to process. Anything that gives you an edge now is is money in the bank. Yeah. You've got to take it. So certainly that's my advice uh, to NIP. Keep, keep the boy Makalela. Definitely do that. Back to E-League. Obviously, we've had our preliminaries going on. We talked a little bit about Godsent. Me and the boys were on the desk, and uh, it was uh, it was it was an interesting uh, series of games. Uh, we've got the North American preliminaries coming up this week. At the time of recording this, uh, maybe by the time this goes out, they'll have started. But certainly, you know, we we watched the games, and it kind of went the way that we 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 felt it was going to go. Uh, G two. You know, they, they, they did just enough. And I, I kind of felt uh, a little bit sorry because we talked about Kingwin previously on the podcast. We talked about how Kingwin picked up the, those two players from AGG. And I felt they'd made a pretty solid team, actually. I think they'll be very competitive in that Tier 2, maybe even break into that Tier 1. Uh, and they pushed uh, G2 all the way. They had two overtimes uh, on, on the first two maps. So really, uh, really solid. Uh, weren't able to seal a deal and, and, and get a map off them. Uh, and, you know, we saw G2 maybe played within themselves because G2 were brilliant out in Kiev, making it all the way to the final. But again, they just seemed to be a little bit lacking when it mattered. You could see that they didn't quite have that mental resilience uh, that you need to win championships. FaZe had Hellraisers. So FaZe beating Hellraisers is just, yeah. You know, that's to be expected, mm-hmm. uh, and it's it, it it's it's got to be said, it's the t- now is the time for phase. They've really got to do something before the end of this year, or it has been the, one of the biggest wastes of money I've seen in esports. This was a team that cost three quarters of a million dollars, if reports are to be believed, and I believe them. And it's gone through all these transformations, and they can't find a lineup that works. We cannot find five players that can get them results. So they definitely needed to be involved in E-League again. Uh, and they've got, to, they've got to pony up and win something or have a deep tournament run soon. Or they, for me, if FaZe have all that money, all those resources, it might be time to think about a different approach to the project because you can't keep throwing star players together with no real rhyme or reason and just hoping it's going to work mm-hmm. because they've got the talent individually teams don't work like that and very rarely do uh some of the most successful teams in counter-strike history have all had a very clear weak link but somehow the chemistry the cohesion pulls them through phase have none of that chemistry or cohesion they're just a bunch of good players running around trying to get headshots and that'll you know that'll uh, allow you to win against the likes of hellraisers you're never going to win a tournament playing like that and i'm especially upset because I had a bet with Duncan, <laughs> and again, this is the other time I was wrong, that FaZe were going to go big this year. They, after what, what I saw in Collusion of Poker in Romania, at that major, where they, were, they, had that, they lost to the eventual winners of the tournament, MBS, they finished third to fourth. I was like, okay, now they're at FaZe, and I know that FaZe obviously has all these resources available to them. This is, they're going to accelerate. This is how they get to the next level. Never happened. In fact, actually, they've regressed massively, gone backwards. What, uh, what was his bet? <laughs> we haven't even quantified what it was. He said that Virtus Pro, were gonna, who were also in a huge slump. At, at the time we made the bet, Virtus Pro were in a slump, and there was lots of talk about people retiring. Maybe Taz was retiring, people were going to get cut, and FaZe were in a slump, but FaZe have all these like star players and money to burn. So, you know, I said, well, I, I honestly think FaZe will do better this year than Virtus Pro. Obviously already lost that bet, even though, <laughs> you know, we've still got four months left or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah. Ma- ma- massively, massively got wrecked. You don't want to lose the Duncan. Three months, in fact. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, obviously, lost that bet to Duncan. Uh, Duncan and me are trying to think of a funny forfeit to do. But, uh, obviously, we don't want to... You can't shave my head. <laughs> um, you know, I, so I don't know what it'll be. But I guess we'll work it out. Anyway, phase are there. Dignitas, man, this team. 
Oh boy. When you talk about Denmark having all this talent, and indeed lots of that talent seems to be concentrated within Dignitas, I don't know why they're struggling to win games, but they are bad. You know, they lost like a map to Tengri, that Kazakhstani team, uh, in these preliminaries. They lost, um, you know, they they, 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 they labored against, uh, I think it was it was Gambit they, they played, right? So, two 16-14s. And I just don't, again, this is a team that's struggling for an identity. You brought Cajun B in from Astralis. Cajun B's meant to be this big star player who's going to, like, carry games for you and do all these amazing things. In Astralis, it was feast or famine with him, I always felt. So, you know, he'd either go off and, and win you a game, or he'd be absent. But usually it wouldn't matter because you've got all these other great players. He's done nothing in Dignitas. That justifies the, the exchange of Kirby to me. He's done absolutely nothing. And I just wonder, because I've seen this before with Cage, and I've followed his career a long, long time. I've seen him in Source. He used to do this all the time. It would be, he'd get in a team, they'd become the best in Denmark, they'd start making uh, overtures that they were going to maybe be, be uh, players in the international scene, and then he'd leave. He'd go inactive, he'd claim he was retiring, he'd military service, whatever it was. There would always be something that would come up and he'd leave. And then he'd be back like a month later with another team. And I just wonder if his head's in it anymore. I wonder if he's left Astralis, where I think he had a pretty good relationship with everybody there, felt pretty comfortable. The team, sure, you know, notorious chokers, but didn't matter. No one was going anywhere. Uh, they had a solid unit. This move happens, and now he's playing with MSL, who can be a bit of a hard-headed leader. Uh, a bit difficult to get along with in a working capacity, let's put it that way. Uh, and has had notable fractious relationships with other players in the past, uh, including Pimp of Team Liquid. And I, I just wonder if his head's in it anymore. I wonder if he's thinking, I might just need to, you know, go sit on my couch for a few months and just chill, because this, is, this isn't fun. And, it's certain, and it isn't, dude. You know, they're struggling to beat teams that, well, maybe four months ago, they, they would have put away with relative ease. And this is uh, this is worrying. A worrying trend, you might say. And then, obviously, we talked about godsend and alternate attacks. Very looking forward to seeing alternate attacks in A-League. Because I don't think they're going to get a, a single result when they get here. So... Just putting that on record as well. <laughs> Feel free to prove me wrong, fans. Humble pie. <laughs> yeah, more humble pie for me. Uh, we have about three minutes left. Okay, well, I guess it's time to wrap up then. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what one thing, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll go. Uh, good news, if you like hit registration uh, in your games, because uh, Valve, um, thanks to the help of a chap on Reddit, who I believe his name was Spurk, uh, but, I, but I could be wrong. Uh, they identified a model bug that had been in the game since a recent update, and they're going to fix it. And they've put some patches in, and they've brought out uh, basically like a beta, uh, or a beta, as you say out here, uh, kind of client as well. So positive changes. Um, the game is definitely developing uh, still, and Valve are remaining hands-on with the game. And, you know, they've made a few quality of life improvements, and the community have uh, received it quite well, although some people, are, as always, are dreaming of, mm. you know, could, could there be more? Mm. Could there be more? They're always going to be asking for more. Yeah, of course. Well, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that was good news and definitely worth mentioning, and we'll, we'll see how that impacts on competitive play and see how the pros react to it. So that's it, really. Do you have anything to add, Gabe? Uh, yeah, so this podcast is going to be on Google Play and Apple iTunes this week, so make sure you be on the lookout for that. Other than that, we'll see you hopefully next week. Yeah, hopefully. 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 Uh, okay, then. Yeah, so um, thanks a lot for watching. I guess we'll see you next time.